He wanted to rescue his wife who was being taken away by the police so he began provoking the police. Not only did he freeze seven police officers, but he also left the message release his wife on the ice. After learning about Fry's intention to rescue his wife, Jim and the others faced a dilemma. His wife's condition was very critical and she needed immediate medical attention. However, there were not enough security personnel to accompany her to the hospital. Just when everyone was unsure how to handle the situation, Barnes came up with a solution. That was to send his wife to Arkham. There, they would have medical equipment, doctors, and sufficient security personnel. Jim thought Barnes' suggestion was very reasonable. At this point in Arkham Hospital, Hugo opens an elevator door with a key in the corner of the hospital. When he walked out the door, it turned out to be Indian Hills Hospital. Peabody told Hugo that Bridget had been uncooperative in the experiments, and she felt the need to intensify the experiments. Hugo told her to handle it herself. Peabody then pulled out a newspaper with news about fries in the past few days. She said that recently, this person had successfully developed freezing and thawing technology, which excited Hugo a little, because it was the problem they were currently facing. Hugo then asked for a man who had been frozen by Fry. He wanted to extract Fry's achievements from the person, but he had no success. However, Peabody said that she had just received a call from Barnes at the police station. They wanted to bring Fry's wife to Arkham and have them watch over her. Hugo was very happy about this. At that moment, Fry's learned from the broadcast that his wife was about to be taken to Arkham. Knowing that it was a trap set by the police, he didn't care at all because he had created a more powerful weapon. Soon after, Fry's wife was brought into Arkham. Meanwhile, a sniper spotted a speeding truck approaching. Everyone started shooting, but the truck didn't stop and crashed into Arkham. When it came to a halt, they found a civilian frozen to the steering wheel. Jim realized it was a trap. The wall of the custodial ward cracked from freezing, and Fry's wearing upgraded equipment walked in. The police squad was completely defenseless against his freeze grenades. Inside the control room, Hugo used the access control system to guide Fry's step by step to a specific room. Hugo told Fry's that he greatly admired him. He can help Fry's get his wife back, but he needs to leave a tube of cryo behind. Fry's thought for a moment, pulling out the freezer fluid and reaching for the car keys next to him. Just as Jim was preparing to move Fry's wife, Fry's arrived. Concerned about Leslie, Jim had no choice but to let Fry's go. Fry's brought Nora back to the basement, preparing to freeze his wife. Nora said she didn't want to be frozen, she wanted to be with Fry's. But Fry's assured her that he would find a cure for her illness and be by her side when that happened. Nora said she wanted to wear the necklace he gave her. While Fry's went to fetch the necklace, Nora switched the refrigerant fluid in Fry's gun. When Fry's returned, he didn't notice that the refrigerant fluid had been replaced. After freezing his wife, she started to shatter. No, 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 no! Nora's passing shattered Fry's. He didn't understand why Nora didn't listen to him, didn't believe him. In his grief, Fry's injected the refrigerant fluid into his own body. Inside Indian Hill Hospital, Hugo looked at the patients in the ward. To his surprise, Fries, who had frozen himself to death, appeared here. Fries was also astonished, wondering why he was here. Hugo told him that, due to his frequent carrying of cryogenic agents, he had absorbed some of them himself. This allowed him to withstand certain levels of cold. Now he could survive at temperatures as low as 20 degrees Celsius, but above zero, he'll die of heat. At the same time, Hugo informed him that there was a new project that wanted him to participate. To give him confidence in his new life, Hugo told him that death is not the end, but a new beginning. Later, Hugo entered another laboratory where there were several large containers holding people. Upon closer inspection, Theo, Jerome, and Mooney were inside. Oswald was tied to an electric chair. But rest assured, nothing <laughs> Previously, Oswald and Jim killed Theo at the docks. Although Jim managed to escape during the subsequent internal investigation, 
Barnes suspected Jim's involvement in Theo's death. However, without evidence, he could only let Jim continue working. A few days later, Oswald was captured and brought to the police station. Jim was shocked to see Oswald being arrested. Barnes approached Jim and said that they would soon find out who killed Theo. No matter how Barnes questioned him, Oswald kept claiming that he killed Theo himself. He did it to avenge his mother, and he was willing to bear all the consequences alone. Seeing Oswald being arrested, Riddler came over. Oswald said he didn't want to get out because if he told them he was crazy, they would send him to Arkham. At least there, he could take some time to readjust and come back when he was ready. Oswald asked Riddler to go to his mother's grave during this time. The next day, Oswald was sent to Arkham. But as soon as he arrived, he faced a so warm welcome from the patients. The patients make fun of Oswald's walk, and Oswald gets on top of the table and says he's the king of Gotham. While that might work in Gotham, he forgot that this was Arkham. Oswald lost his temper for a moment. In the evening, Hugo prepared to meet the King of Gotham. After finishing a psychological consultation with a patient, he invited Oswald into his office. Oswald's just entered the office and he's acting like the boss. He poured himself a drink and sat down, drinking it arrogantly. Hugo wasn't bothered and asked Oswald if he regretted killing Theo. Oswald smiled and said he didn't regret it at all. Hugo didn't say much and directly escorted Oswald out. But before leaving, he told Oswald that Arkham had many treatments, and there would surely be one suitable for him. Sure enough, when Oswald returned to his room, the person who had just come out of Hugo's office was laughing foolishly. And when he turned his head, Oswald frightened. He began to suspect that Arkham wasn't as simple as he thought. Now Oswald was in Arkham Asylum due to Oswald's arrogance. Hugo decided to teach him a lesson. At that moment, Oswald was playing a game with others. Seeing this, he felt relieved, realizing that it was all just a dream. In reality, what had happened earlier was true, but now he was tormented to the point where he couldn't distinguish between reality and dreams. In the following days, Oswald gradually became lost in this torment. On that day, Jim escorted Fry's wife to Arkham. Jim passes him by, frantic for Jim to take him away. But Jim's reaction chilled his heart to the core. As the staff took Oswald away, he shouted that Jim had killed Theo. However, no one at the scene paid attention to his words. They all thought he was crazy, but this scene was observed by Hugo, who was watching from the other side of the surveillance. Subsequently, Hugo and Peabody watched Oswald, who was tied to the electric chair with a face of enjoyment. Hugo stimulated Oswald's brain through continuous electric shocks, causing him to lose the ability to distinguish between reality and dreams. With a course of treatment completed, Hugo wanted to see the results. So he provided Oswald with a separate serving of ice cream. Oswald didn't feel much, but the person across from him got upset and beat him up. However, Oswald didn't fight back. Hugo saw this and felt that Oswald had made significant progress in his treatment. If he were released back into the outside world, no one would recognize him as the former King of Gotham. When Oswald appeared in Hugo's office again, he had lost his initial arrogance. Hugo asked Oswald if he regretted killing Theo. Oswald nodded repeatedly and said he regretted it. Upon hearing this, Hugo smiled, seeing that the treatment was effective. Hugo mentioned that Oswald would be completely recovered in a while, and then he could leave. Oswald was happy to hear this. However, knowing it was Oswald, Hugo still had some concerns and decided to test him further. He locked Oswald in a room with the previous patient and gave Oswald a fruit knife, but Oswald had no intention of seeking revenge. He even cut the ropes on the patient's body. Seeing this, Hugo completely let go of his guard. A few days later, Hugo called Oswald into his office and told him that his illness had been cured and he was now a normal person who could leave Arkham. With a certificate in hand, Oswald happily left. After Oswald left, Peabody asked Hugo if he was being careless by letting Oswald go. Hugo replied that it was an experiment and assured her that he had it under control. She didn't need to worry. 
Under Hugo's gaze, Oswald walked out of Arkham. On this day, Leslie told Jim that she realized Kristen had months of paychecks left. Jim didn't want Leslie to worry, so he said he would look into it. Jim then found Riddler and asked him about Kristen's whereabouts. Riddler said he didn't know, and they hadn't been in contact since they broke up. It turned out, they had already separated, and Jim didn't ask anything further before leaving. Riddler believed that Jim had realized Kristen was dead and now had suspicions about him. A few days later, Riddler found Jim and asked if he had found Kristen. Jim said no, and asked Riddler not to worry. He would notify him if there was any news. That night, Riddler drew a green question mark on Jim's photo. Just then, Jim received a report of a bomb at the bus station. When Jim arrived, he found a box with a green question mark on it, emitting a ticking sound. He deduced that the bomb was inside. He began evacuating people while grabbing a pry bar nearby to open the locker. But what he doesn't know is that it's all a Riddler plot. When he returned to the police station, Barnes approached him. Someone had reported him as the true killer of Theo, and Internal Affairs was taking it seriously. After all, Theo was a billionaire and former mayor, so they decided to reopen the investigation. Jim felt anxious upon hearing this. He thought Oswald had betrayed him. Instead of suing Jim, Oswald came to Butch. Since Theo was killed and Oswald was arrested, Butch and Tabitha became the underground kings of Gotham and took over Oswald's assets. When Butch and Tabitha saw Oswald, they wanted to kill him. But Oswald claimed he was a good person and had certificates to prove it. Tabitha still didn't believe him, so she used his mother to provoke him. Instead of getting angry, Oswald made jokes in response. Tabitha realized that Oswald had been mentally affected by his time in Arkham. Although they didn't plan to kill him, they decided to teach him a lesson. Riddler was packing a crowbar into his backpack. At that moment, someone knocked on the door, and when he opened it, he found Oswald covered in fur. Oswald says he's better now but has no place to stay and wants to come over for a few days. Seeing Oswald's condition, Riddler's expression changed. He said that the mentor he found was the former King of Gotham, not the current Penguin. He no longer needed Oswald's guidance, but he still thanked Oswald for telling him the story between him and Jim. Originally, he wanted to share his plan with Oswald, but seeing he current state, he decided it was unnecessary to do so. He then closed the door and rejected Oswald because he had more important matters to attend to. Riddler went to a police colleague's house and, when the colleague wasn't paying attention, used a crowbar to fatally strike him. On the other side, Jim received a call from Harvey, who said that the bomb at the bus station was activated by a cell phone. They have now traced the location of the cell phone. Shortly after, Jim arrived at the address Harvey mentioned, it turned out to be the home of the police officer who was killed with a crowbar. Jim discovered the lifeless body of the officer. At that moment, the door opened and it was Barnes. Barnes asked Jim why he was here. Jim explained that Harvey called him, stating that they traced the signal of the bomb's detonator to this location. Jim asked Barnes why he was here. Barnes explained that he received a text message from the person lying on the ground, claiming to have an important clue to share with him and that clue was about Jim. Subsequently, Barnes handcuffed Jim and took him back to the police station. At the police station, Barnes mentioned that Jim's fingerprints were found on the murder weapon, the same crowbar from the bus station incident. Jim expressed confusion, stating that he had no motive to kill the officer. Barnes revealed that the officer was the anonymous person who reported Jim. A signed statement identical to the letter was recovered from his home. Both of them were unaware that they had been deceived by Riddler. Everything was planned by Riddler. First, they designed a bomb at the bus station, obtained Jim's fingerprints, and then used a crowbar with his fingerprints to kill someone else, framing someone as an anonymous tipster in Jim's case. Jim's speechless, and Barnes says he's disappointed. Consequently, Jim was imprisoned. The Internal Affairs Division also announced that Jim was found guilty of intentional murder, and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Due to his unintended actions, Riddler began to suspect Jim. As a result, 
Riddler devised a series of elaborate plans to ensure that Jim would never be able to clear his name. Meanwhile, at Arkham Asylum, Barbara, who was severely injured and unconscious, miraculously woke up upon hearing the news of Jim's imprisonment. 